Here. Katie Avalos. Here. Danielle Bailey is here. Karen Cronwell is excused. And Carla Pennington Cross, not yet here. Will be soon. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> moving on to item 1C, you may stay on the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. It is to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving on to item one, media. I have a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Uh, Okay, there's a motion to approve the agenda. Any objections? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. And then I'll move on to item 1P, approval of July minutes. I move to approve the minutes from July 10th and July 24th. I'll second. Okay, there is a motion to approve the July 10th and July 24th meeting minutes. Any objections? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Now we'll move on to our public comments portion, uh, item 2A. So anybody, any visitor may speak on a non-agenda item this time. Come on up, state your name and address. Wayne Martin, 7275 North Fort Washington Road, apartment 1221. Glendale, Wisconsin, 53217. What's on your mind? So with all the stuff going on for the audits, I was wondering if the significant deficiencies from the prior audit had been resolved and if they're no longer an issue going forward or so I'll I'll pause you because I we are going to be talking about the audit under will that be the business office update? I'm sorry if that's not. So if you want to hold your question until after that presentation, is that all right? And then if you still have it, you may ask it then. Okay, anything else? Are you all still planning on getting a newsletter out? Just in general or? Just in general, like saying all the work that you've done, what you're doing since I know oh. you talked about not really having any good press unless you do it yourself and mm -hmm. wanting to get some good news out there probably before the referendum if that's at all legal yeah. uh that's a great question so i think uh we did have our budget communications that were going out regularly and i think that we have talked about sending something out um to discuss the referendum i think as well as just give some updates from the business office but i I don't want to speak out of turn. I think we're still in that transit. We're transitioning. Not sure if we're ready to send it out, but yeah. Uh, right now we're in the process of, of determining whether we're going to vote for effort. So we need to right. walk through that process first and make sure that we're lined up before we send out those communications. So likely in early fall. And then last non-agenda item okay. that I have for now, the Nick Lace Award tomorrow's giving presentation on get the phrase right their academic career planning and part of that says that they're involving you all in the discussions are they actually doing that thanks Wayne. anyone else for anyone online um carla did join us now so we okay, have both so we'll kelly and carla online carla um, and you guys see me can't see you, but I can hear you. You're like a ghost. No. <laughs> um, anyone else? Any visitor? Okay. Then we'll close public comments. We'll move on to item 3A, which is our financial forecasting update. And we have Michelle Brown and a fair reference and a fair represent. Um, would you guys like to take it over? Sure. So I noticed in the um, order here that the referendum review and timeline is, you know, that's this or is that? That's next. That would be next. Yeah. So yeah. we're all set there. Yeah. Okay. So you don't want me to review this at this point? 
Oh, no, no, you can. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. You can. Oh, thanks. Uh, sorry for the. No, that's okay. Uh, okay. No, and so thanks. Um, and as you know, um, Anna, Michelle, and Diane Kurtzborn have been working really hard uh, to, you know, kind of get things uh, squared up. And I think Michelle has been working Marquez Guzman in our office to um, update the budget model. But I just wanted to kind of set the stage, you know, uh, for that conversation. This, you know, potentially is leaning in the direction of an operating referendum. And I thought it would just be really good to review with the board, and, you know, kind of what that looks like, generally speaking. And so briefly, I'd just like to kind of go through um, this presentation. Um, so the first page. Um, Sorry, can I pause this for just a second? Are we are we doing item three three right now? Then referendum timeline review, um, or this is more part of understanding our current. Yes. This is about understanding our current financial. Okay. Budget. Okay. And, and okay. I will talk specifically about our timeline. And okay. Our okay. Okay. Thanks. It does seem a little bit. No, I got it. They're, 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 they're all so yeah. Right. I, 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 I got you. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So. Um, the first uh, page is just, you know, a review of what the revenue limit is for um, your resources for primarily running the general fund of the school district. So that uh, referendum uh, limit authority is based on basically three components. Um, you take your three year average of membership times your per pupil um, allowable revenue limit authority plus any exemptions, including uh, non-recurring or recurring referendum exemptions, and that gives you the total resources for the school district. Uh, so those are the components of that. Um, the per pupil adjustment or that per pupil um, component is set by the legislature. So back in 1993, um, when revenue limits were put in place, um, the legislature basically said, throws everyone where they were at. Think of it as like a game of, you know, married around one, two, three, everyone sitting wherever you were spending at that point in time, that was where you were frozen or starting with your revenue limit authority. And so there were disparities among school districts based on what they'd spent the year before. And the state put a floor in or minimum revenue limit uh, floor for spending. But it, there was, you know, it wasn't necessarily equal. They also said that annually they would increase that per pupil spending amount by the rate of inflation, which is what they did through roughly the year 2013. In 2013, however, they kind of broke stride with that, and uh, the biennial budget allowed for a discretionary increase um, in that revenue limit authority uh, or in that per pupil spending amount. And so the chart that we show here is basically just a chart from 2013 forward um, showing in green what the inflation index was annually and in yellow what the actual increase was allowable per student and the purpose of this chart is to show you that you know beginning in 2013 we started lagging in terms of what that per pupil increase was relative to the rate of inflation so the line, the blue line, is basically what that per pupil increase would have been had those increases kept pace with inflation over time. And you can see that that number is $2,302 per student. Um, that is basically lagging what the inflation index would have been from 2013 to 2024. Um, and you'll notice down along the bottom that there are a couple of years, 2022 and 2023, where there was no increase to that per pupil uh, amount. Um, those were years where there were uh, a lot of federal dollars coming into um, the school district from ESSER funding due to the pandemic. However, when the state kind of, you know, reinstated that increase, you know, we were then building on a year where there was no increase previously. And so, you know, it almost set you back. And you can see, if you look at that line, if you're a number steep like I am, like if you notice the slope of that line getting really steep there, that's the result of that, um, you know, kind of ESSER funding cliff. And then after 2023, the ESSER funds were gone. Um, and then we kind of, you know, went back to the old, old formula. But when those funds were gone, you know, you, you either, had to have, you know, adjusted your budget back down or made some other accommodation. So I think that's just helpful when you kind of look at the state and what that kind of 
backdrop is. Um, so many school districts, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, whether it's declining enrollment. One second, sorry. Carla has her hand raised, so I just want to know if oh. if she should speak now or if. What? Can you? Is it? A, would you prefer we hold our questions till the end? Or no, that's you? fine. Whatever okay. I, I conversational side. Okay. Go ahead, okay. Carla. Oh, okay. I I just want to make sure I understand. Um, what you're saying through this chart is that as of 2024 compared to 2013, if we were just following inflation, we would be getting 2,300 and change more per pupil than we currently get, right? Correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Just making sure I understand. Yeah, I'm glad you asked, thank you. Um, so for a variety of reasons, including the fact that, you know, uh, that per pupil increase um, has not kept pace with inflation, as well as the fact that, you know, generally there are less students in the state of Wisconsin. There's a lot of pressure on revenue limits uh, within school districts. And so many school districts have had to consider an operational referendum. There are two paths you can go uh, on for operational referendum. One is to ask for a recurring uh, amount. So it's added to your revenue base and then it stays there and just continues in perpetuity. Um, the other is to ask for a non-recurring uh, increase and a non-recurring increase is an amount that is some certain both in terms of the amount and the length of time that it's included in the budget. Um, so, you know, the example here is a three-year non-recurring referendum for $900,000 each year um, or for three years um, that drops off after year three. So the implication there is that, you know, in that third year of this example, that the school board would probably consider replacing that revenue at that point in time. So, um, you may ask, why would you consider a recurring or a non-recurring referendum? You know, it's really, you know, a recurring referendum obviously has its appeal um, because you don't have to then continually go back and ask for additional resources. Um, however, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, if you have declining enrollment and then that's part of your revenue base, the effectiveness of a recurring referendum starts to lose its efficacy over time. You know, based on that, it's likely that you would be going back to touch up that fee in the future. Um, additionally, we've just seen that um, recurring referendums are not as well accepted uh, by the public as a non-recurring referendum. Um, so for a variety of reasons, non-recurring referendums have been more popular. Um, I think that, you know, the downside to a non-recurring referendum is obviously kind of get on that gerbil wheel of needing to go back periodically uh, to ask, but it is also an opportunity to, you know, kind of build credibility um, and build towards that answer. And it gives you the opportunity not only to adjust your budget periodically, um, but also react to what you know is happening in the district. So uh, questions on that? And I know a lot of this is review. So uh, the Sorry, next yeah, yeah, sure. Quickly. So if the if the, the per pupil limit or for people aid had kept it with an inflation then your revenue limit authority would be if this is sort of a trying to expert card would be um two like about two million more a year is that based on your probably based on your role yeah okay okay um uh, so this chart here uh, just gives you a sense as to who has asked you uh, for an operational referendum since 1990. Um, so you know, on the left, you can see in shaded, shaded in blue are the districts that have gone to operational referendum, whether they've been successful or not um, throughout the state. Um, and it represents roughly 86% of the school population or school district um, population throughout the state. Um, so that, that's a large number. We do know heading into uh, November, it is a record ask for uh, referendum questions, particularly operational questions. So the next page is just uh, taking that prior slide and showing you the districts who have passed an operational reference uh, since 1990. Uh, so 77 of those districts, 301, have passed an operational reference uh, since 1990.
And then I just wanted to give you a sense as to the uh, kind of the public uh, perception or you know uh, acceptance of, of both of those um, referendums. So this ten-year history of non-recurring referendums uh, and their pass fail rate uh, over the last ten years, and roughly seventy-seven. Thank you. <laughs> Seventy-seven percent of those um, referendums have been successful uh, in the state, and you know it shows you where those have been uh, successful. Uh, the following page uh, again is the recurring referendum history over that ten-year period of time. There have been less of them, uh, far less, um, and those have been uh, successful roughly seventy-one percent of the time. So slightly less accepted than um, the non-recurring. I will say that the non-recurring referendums, you know, by nature, are going to be a larger number because uh, they're not recurring. So if you pass one for three years, you're probably coming back a couple of times, and there are school districts in there that may have asked three times. So they would have, you know, three of those questions in that number. So that definitely skews that number higher. And then the last piece of uh, referendum information that I wanted to share with you, I think, is kind of a telling number. So um, the chart on the left is a chart that shows the number of districts who have passed an operational referendum, a uh, non-recurring referendum, where that referendum represents 10% or more of their budget. So, you know, think of that for a minute. 10% or more of that, their budget is on this recurring cycle. And you can see that that number grew from 36 districts in 2014 to over 100 districts uh, last year. Um, and I think that that is a really, in my mind, a very telling number uh, when you think about what that means. It means, you know, like, you know, there are 100 school districts out there that maybe are a, basketball, a bad basketball coach who may not having at least 10% of their operating record available to them. Or, you know, uh, they're kind of subject to the whims uh, of the public. And that's, you know, that even just it, it represents the pressure that school districts are under. So specifically to you, um, I just wanted to give you a sense as to what your tax levy looked like yesterday, last year. And I know this is uh, uh, kind of a review for you, uh, but your total tax levy was roughly 14 million 992, exactly 14 million 992, 180. Um, and that represented $13.2 million of your revenue limit authority, plus community service uh, levy of a million 751. So that's for programming that is uh, community wide, um, and you had no referendum debt in that number. So, it primarily was your operational uh, number. You do have debt outstanding that is Fund 38 debt, which is inside your revenue limit, but you don't have it Fund 39 debt, which would be referendum debt that's outside of your revenue. Did I catch your question? Yeah, you yeah. So, uh, what does that mean in terms of tax rate? Uh, to get to that tax rate, you would take that total fourteen million nine ninety two would divide it by the total value, uh, excluding TIF districts in the community for last year. That total value was roughly uh, two billion five hundred million dollars, um, equating to a tax rate or a bill rate of six dollars and thirteen cents per thousand, meaning that the owner of a one hundred thousand dollar home would pay. Uh, Six dollars six hundred and thirteen dollars on that uh, school money that's so um, six hundred and thirteen dollars per thousand for that money. So if you look at your tax rate historically, you can see where that uh, stands uh, relative to where it was over the last you know, probably ten years. Uh, we had a high of seven dollars and forty seven cents, which you know dropped a uh, generally kind of bounced. In that range between six fifteen and seven dollars in that period of time. And then I thought it would be helpful to compare uh, that tax rate to peers. Um, so we've got K 12 districts uh, listed here um, throughout the community. On the right hand side are the three K 8 districts that represent the Nicolay Union High School. And on top, we've added a 474. That is the Nicolay Union High School tax rate to the K 8 tax rate, just to give you a sense as to where those compare. Um, 
The next slide, I think, is also very helpful when you're considering, you know, kind of what your past history has been with regard to referendums. So in 2008, you had a referendum to issue debt uh, for about $3.7 million uh, that was approved. And then the last three referendums beginning in 2011 have all been for non-recurring operational referendums. All three of those have been supported. Um, the 2019 uh, question uh, was a million five eighty, um, which will expire in 2024-25. So this budget that you're creating is last year that has that one million five eighty. Was that a question? Nope, that was someone joining. Sorry, okay, Jenica's here now. <laughs> uh, Last summary of operational referendum, or not operational, or just referendums throughout the uh, area, just to give you a sense as to who has passed a referendum really since 2019 in that peer group. And you can see there's a lot of referendums that have been considered and passed. Um, most of them failed in pink. Uh, I would say all but one, I think it was for issuing debt. Um, and all of the other, with the exception of one operating referendums have been supported. All of those operational referendums, with the exception of one, were not recurring. When you say issuing debt, is that the ID? Mm -hmm. The ID that's yeah. like um, getting approval from voters to to get a loan. Yes, um, for capital projects. For capital. Correct. Yep. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. And oh, sorry, I just wanted the R R means. Recurring. Recurring. Yeah, and, and R is not The very last slide, which I think is helpful, is just a schedule of where, when you actually go to referendum um, based on state statute. And um, even though in even numbered years, there are technically four opportunities to go to the public, they really break down into two opportunities one in the spring and one in the fall, because the spring primary and spring general, fall primary and fall uh, general, occur too close to each other, or you practically consider going in the spring primary in February and then coming back in April. So really, in even number of years, you have two opportunities, one in the spring, one in the fall, or the primary or general. Similarly, in even number, I'm sorry, in odd number of years, you just have the spring opportunity. So um, considering your short-term options, you really have an opportunity to go to referendum, an operational referendum if you're considering it your term um, in November or in April of 2025, the next opportunity, spring of 2026. And last but not least, there's a 70-day period that precedes that election date uh, that's important because the board needs to take action on a resolution 70 days prior to that election date in order to approve the question and purpose for that operation referendum to get it valid on uh, from the municipal courts. So, you know, for a, uh, a November referendum uh, in 2024, that date is August 27th. Um, of this month, uh, and uh, of the date for April 25, um, seven days prior is January 21st of 25. So think of, you know, uh, quasi WASB convention in Milwaukee. You know, that's really what you think about that. Can I ask some technical questions? Sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, if you have a referendum on the November 24 ballot, uh, you, you're asking for the the preceding two academic years. So uh, in November, you say if we have money for 25, 26, 26, 27. So it, the, most school districts that are considering a November referendum are approaching it with two levels in there. You know, when they approve their October 24 budget for 2025, you know, 24, 25. Okay. So, we'll, you could have that money available for the levy that you sent out this year. Is that the answer to the question? So, okay, so it's, it, you have a referendum 
say it's a two year non recurring it passes, you get that money when. So you, you decide as a board that you could have it included in the current budget that you're working on right now. Okay. Or you could defer it to the following year's budget. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But so you could have it as, as this year's budget. And then how, so going with my hypothetical of a two year non recurring, so you, you say you allocate it to 24, 25, 25, 26. When can you go back to the public or something else? So you can go, in, you're limited to two questions a calendar year. Okay. So you technically could go in 2025 for your 26 27 ask if you want to. Okay. I think, you know, that would be a lot of. That's it, not wise. But yeah, you know, it, it, right? that would be a lot of stress on you. And no, I'm just you, thinking. Yeah. Yeah, but that's sort of curious. Yeah. You need to bit. know what the brackets are. But. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for length? Like Danielle used, you know, two year. Yeah. Um, is that kind well, of what you'd recommend or so yeah, there things we should given consider? your your situation, yes, I think two years would make sense. I really like the idea of two years for a couple of reasons. One, it's kind of the timeline that we surveyed. And I also feel like, you know, you're still um yeah, I think you've done a lot of the hard work of, you know, getting the budget the way and the look and the feel that you want it to be. You're going to learn a lot this year as we roll forward, and I think you're going to have a lot of good information, and it gives you a short window in order to adjust based on what you think. And I think you're going to have a very good path. So for that reason, I think two years, in my mind, makes sense. One year seems way too short, right? Um, three years, I think, is probably given your situation too long. Thank you. Carla has a question. Carla? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I should know the answer to this, but I'm not sure. The with the biennial budget cycle, is it this winter that the um levy limits could hypothetically go up? Correct. Right. So, you know, we'll have a new budget, you know, probably by next summer, correct? Okay. So this the this is the advocacy cycle, in other words, for like the what the traveling joint finance committee and all that stuff happens this winter. And I think okay. you know, you know, kind of the timing question. We'll know a lot more obviously as so you know what what those parameters are based on what we know in this summer. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I have one more actually just back to that per pupil um amount is the per pupil uh what do you have per pupil limit per pupil amount that's right yeah. okay yeah. um is that also does the state also set that amount for private or charter schools or how what is their how does that work yeah their, their reimbursement yes I you know I think that there is a per pupil amount for um choice and I can put some charter students as well that is you know generally the per people increase um tracks directly to you know we got the, the, the public school system got 325 it's a similar increase the charter of choice oh really okay if they come question um is there like a best practice for you know, if you run it in November for having it start this year or next year, or is it kind of a based on need? You know, I think it really, it really is dependent on the school district specifically. I don't know. Today on a question. Wait. Oh, hold on. Uh, sorry. One second. Um, I want to make sure the board is done with. Are you guys? Done with your questions, Carla? Are you all done with your questions? Okay. And you, Kayla, do you have a question for Kevin? Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you, so I can move to audience for Kevin, right? Well, what, what, what else is part of this? Um, Michelle needs to present on our finance as far as specific districts in response to what the background information I have. Okay. Um, since we were asking questions for the presentation, 
I'll allow, I'll, yeah. Okay, Kayla, do you want to, can you say their name and are you asking us in your capacity as a school employee or as a community citizen? Kind of both. <laughs> um, Kayla, well, you don't need to pick one. Okay, yeah. um, community. <laughs> Okay, okay. Kayla Roshevsky. Yeah, there 2503 West Margaret for Glendale, Wisconsin. When you said that what the mill rate was, um, Glendale was just reassessed in the last six weeks. Um, is that based on last year or is that mill rate based on our new assessments that we just received? So that's based went up on 45%. Yeah, that's based on equalized out last year. And so what happened with the assessment process is the assessments that were reassessed this year will come up and get closer to that new, to the equalized value that is established by the state. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, we can move on. Oh, anything on that? Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Thank yeah, you. Hard, yeah. Do you want me to stay here? Yes, yeah, sure. You can. Yeah, sure. She'll be on the line. Yeah, Taylor, do you have that? When did you document if you can project that or should I project it? I will. Did you send it recently? Yes. Okay, one moment. It's the newest. Shared it with you. All right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Thanks for being patient. Okay. I mean, otherwise, I have it right okay, here. Let me zoom in. Hold on. Sorry, everybody. Oh, I'll make it bigger. It's just a little, it's just a little laggy. And so I'm just trying to do this from afar. All right. So I'm going to go up here okay. and then I'm just start there. Okay. This is, you make a little, so it fits the screen. Mm -hmm. um, yep, sorry, everybody. This is showing the budget projection that was presented. Sorry, this is the preliminary budget that was presented um, two weeks ago that the board approved. Um, the blue column is the year that we just finished. That's still unaudited. Um, so there could be some slight changes there. And then the budget here, 24, 25, is what we're looking at. We currently have um, the taxpayers who have approved, this is the last year of uh, operational referendum, uh, Google to exceed the revenue limit by uh, 1,580,000. So that is showing, um, one thing I did here too is took off, we had a fund balance in fund 80, so I've taken that part off of levy in this scenario here. So you see that um, the total school-based levy would be 13, 687, 090. And then the mill rate based on October property values last October would be 548, where this year we just finished with 613. Then if you scroll, scroll down, this is showing a scenario if the district were uh, to approve an operational referendum of 4.5 million for two years, starting in the current year, the 24, 25 year, and then the 25, 26 year. And what you're looking at, like you see the funds and revenues, so kind of mid, you know, page there, um, that would include that those additional revenues and then our expenditures what the surplus or deficit it is. If it's black, it's the sur surplus. And then what it, you see in red in future years would be a deficit. And then right below that would be the fund balance. So if this were to, if we went with, it had approval of the 4.5 million, then we would end the year, projected to end the year with a fund balance of 6,113,655. Next year, we would, the budget would actually have a deficit of $478,081, but we would end the year with the fund balance. We would dip in that fund balance slightly. Um, the 1.5 million, uh, 1.5A would no longer be on our levy. We would be levying that additional 
four million five hundred thousand. So we would end the year with a fund balance of five million six hundred thirty five thousand five hundred seventy four dollars. And then if we were not to have an additional operational levy in next year, you can see that that's red. We would still have a slight fund balance of five hundred sixty nine thousand four ten, and then next year would you know we would need an operational definitely again for that. So that is to get us through, not to that's that wouldn't be building on balance. That's okay. Um, Th that's all right. So that scenario would get us through, you know, those years, but not build our balance. And if you scroll um, down a little bit, this is showing the same thing with the 1.58 still this year, and then uh, um, having an operational referendum of four million for two years. So that fund balance is kind of where you know you're looking. You see. You know, we'd have a surplus this year. Next year, we'd have a deficit, but we'd still have a fund balance. And then the following year, we would have a deficit, no fund balance at all. So we would have to do something again there, too. And in every scenario, we really do have to continue. The district has had operational referendums, you know, supporting our revenues for years. Are you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Is is this are these two numbers reflective of the cuts that we've already made? That is. Yeah. And so, so that's mm -hmm. okay. So that's not like further. That's right. Like everything is status quo. Right. I'm glad you brought that up too. So if you look, you know, we're anticipating that we would have some type of raises in the future okay. and increase in some expenses. So you see those percentages increasing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then at the, the very first line of September membership, that's the FTE. Um, last September was 908. Um, and we're looking at adding additional FTE based on our 4K um, day, their membership number. And then um, enrollment projections have shown us pretty steady with a slight increase. So that's what we're projecting out. Any other questions? I just want to make sure I understand this. I'm going to point. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so this number is so large because we're finishing one while we overlap the other. Yes. Under I mean, this scenario. Okay. I just well wanted to that understand. what you're looking at right here in that scenario is due to the six million dollar state trust fund loan. Got it. I, okay. Yes. The non reoccurring referendum in that scenario is the 1.58, which the taxpayers have approved several years ago. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. You can see the total school based tax levy would be lower this coming year than it was last year. Um, and then Next year, if we did not have an operational reference, it would definitely go down. And then in future years, it goes up slightly. That's that's the natural. It's not going to increase very much. So we do need to. So. You had mentioned that you were taking fund 80 out of this. Yes. So this is our number without the fund 80. Like, like, uh, the 23-24 had the fund 80. That, yes, that's the big difference. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. So this one. Doesn't have that. It, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, last year I believe it was one point seven. Right. You had the more modest like five or six hundred. Okay. Kevin, did you want to add anything on this scenario? No, I think that you know that, that makes all makes sense to me, but I like got closer to it. So um, okay. I guess the one thing I would say is you know. Um, it may be confusing when you're looking at 24, 25 to say, well, geez, you know, it appears that we're doing okay. Back to Michelle's point, that reflects the six million that was borrowed, right? So if that were to come out, you would actually see a deficit of a red number in that column that's about 2.8. You know, like Which if you had done something, right. yeah, right. if you hadn't done something to address that, right? And so, you know, I think that, you know, it may be part of why it looks different. 
<laughs> okay, thank you for this. That's great. You're welcome. All. Uh, are there any questions from online or from the public around this? What's been presented just now? Wait. Mm -hmm. I believe you already answered, but just for absolute confirmation, you can have two referendum or operating referendum going on at the same time. One doesn't cancel the other out. Oh, you mean that you already have authority there? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's that we have that. All right. Carlo, are you able to see the, the numbers as best as can be that I'm sharing? I, I am. I'm on okay. vacation brain still. So I may well, come okay. back with questions, Michelle and Anna. So. Be patient with me, but I, I appreciate the clarity of this information you're providing. Yeah. Okay, then we will move on to item 3B, so referendum timeline review and draft resolution. <laughs> then you're gone. All right. <laughs> um, just for clarity and making sure um, just for clarity and making sure that we have kind of the, the timeline that I approached with the board during our last meeting together, um, wanted to kind of create clarity around that by sort of bringing out those areas in which we've kind of already completed work. Um, tonight, we're going to look at a draft of referendum resolution, um, and I'll be presenting that to the school board just so you can get eyes on what that might look like. Um, we have a uh, uh, potential for a board work session on school finance set for 814, which is next Wednesday. And then 821 would really be that last meeting opportunity to get a board decision for adoption of a referendum resolution for the fall election due to that um, 27th timeline that Kevin mentioned before. So I just wanted to ensure that the board had clarity around sort of our next steps in the timeline this process. Um, any questions around that? All right, so um, what you see, um, and it was attached um, in public and also here in your packet, is um, what that official referendum ballot would look like um, and the wording that would be a part of that. So this is an initial draft um, drafted by um, Orals for us. Um, so we want you to have an opportunity to read through that and take a look at um, what is there, um, what is missing, or what has to be determined by the board is really that dollar amount, which is a bit much more fair. Um, so, Michelle will provide you that information. Kevin provided me that information. Tonight is helping full service and starting to think about what that might be. Um, and I have a question about yeah, that language. Okay, so uh, so it says consisting of operational expenses with the parentheses to maintain district programs. Is that like a choice you're still trying to make, or is that that's how it would be phrased? So the, yeah, so that is a choice that we can make. Um, okay. One of the recommendations that I would um, have the board uh, take into consideration is that um, if we're going to say that it would be consisting of operational referendums and left that last portion of that out, that would be an opportunity for us to essentially add programming, right? right. Um, to put to maintain district programming is clarity to our, our, our community that we're doing is maintaining in these next two years. Um, I think there's some, you know, there's some value to thinking about maintaining at this point, considering that we probably need to look at how we right size and have efficiencies within our current budget and to really demonstrate the full responsibility to the community in these next two years. So, um, you, know, but, you know, ultimately the board will make a decision about that, but I just wanted to to have both of those options sort of availed there to, as they <laughs> All right, so um, the goal of this would be that within our time frame of um, taking a look at um, the information that was presented tonight, potentially some deeper dive work into a workshop on the 14th around our school finances and, and maybe you know, answering more questions that arise from tonight, um, is getting closer to thinking about what that language and what that ask would look like when we approve it. On the so, oh, okay. Uh, sorry, Carla does have a the draft resolution, what we're, we're seeing language for the sample ballot, is that what would go into a draft resolution or like where that's that's the draft resolution that we would have been yesterday? Okay, there's 
Got there, Carla? Um, okay, so we don't have to pass some sort of resolution like other resolutions we've passed. We just have to approve the ballot that we want so, to submit to voters. Prior to the 27th, you'll actually approve, approve two things. One will be a resolution that lays out uh, the, the question similar to the language that's in the ballot. And then there will be a separate resolution calling the question to voters, you know, like actually calling the question on the referendum, which would be the ballot and what you would use to submit to the clerks. Uh, but the, the relevant information, I think, you know, kind of it is the question. Yes, that's the piece that, you know, really requires the thought and consideration. Okay. okay, but otherwise the resolutions that we have to sign is pretty pro forma, pro forma at this point, because everyone uses the same ones. Yes. Okay. Um, so when you're talking about the language choice, in 2019, our 1,000,005, it looks like, if this is right, the language was for non-recurring purposes. Well, I'm sorry, I guess I'm, I'm wondering what they asked, what what was envisioned there. I mean, that's probably just some history that we could dive into to understand. Oh, yes. What that means. Yeah, it was not, no. And so you would have... The non-recurring is just specific that it's you know, that there is a it, it's not part of your revenue base. It sunsets at a point in time. So non-recurring meaning that it ended in 2024-25. Right, but the other one's purpose has maintaining current programs, maintaining current programs, improvement, right? But that issue. So I guess I'm, I'm they they were the also non-recurring as well. You know, so again, it was just language choice. Okay, but that kind of okay. Okay. Uh, any questions online or from the public? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure, we'll have one question for you at our worship. We're done. We're done. Okay. Uh, moving on to our business office update. Shell still in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, is an update on the 22-23 audit, um, starting off with policy 680. No. Okay. Okay. Um, in response to policy 680, the district, um, the 22 is an update for the audit. The 22-23 audit report was not completed by December 2023, as it is should have been it should have been that's when it's due this was due to information not being reported accurately in the financial software with the support of the business office staff and consultants this has now been reconciled as of august 2nd 2024 it's anticipated that schumacher and sama the district's audit firm will have the completed audit reports by the end of september Business office is planning for 23-24 audit work, and we have scheduled that for October 7th through 11th with on-site work. Part of the preparation process is to ensure that all of our financial transactions are reported accurately in the financial software. So that is in progress. Then another um, Update is on invoice payments for the 24-25 school year, um, and that is in um, to comply with purchase uh, policy 6470 payment of invoices. In accordance with this policy, the following revisions to the purchasing, purchasing process have been put into place for the 24-25 fiscal year. Um, these changes support accuracy in accounting practice and fiscal responsibility. Um, first of all, requisitions are now required prior to making purchase purchases um, with orders being made after the approval processes. You can find a requisition. I think I know, but I just want to. It's like a requisition, actually, our financial software Skyward, we do those in there. So um, it's requesting what you want to purchase a service, the supply, the cost of it, what account you're going to use, okay. how many. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can be used to maybe get permission for a service. You know, we send it to that vendor, um, and then they know what we have approval 
and we're going to pay for it. We're committing ourselves to paying for it. Um, one of the, the other things, too, is once these are updated in the system, they're updating those costs to our software. It's encumbering part of the budget. So when the administration looks to approve, you know, an expense, they can see what are those funds there, what's already been spent. So when you're not using that purchase order process, you're not seeing that. So this will help. So hypothetically, like if, uh, if the board is asked to approve a major expenditure, then you'd be able to ask, like, well, what is the balance of said fund? And we would be able to, mm -hmm. to accurately sort of just pull that, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And um, the only exception should be emergency situations, but we still want a purchase order to tie up that transaction, even if it's after the fact majority of purchases that's going to be the rule there would only be exceptions for state evading circumstances and then a interest in the report talking about that encumbrance process um, we are also using another part of purchasing improvements is e-commerce through um, our, that's again offered through skyward with different vendors so this allows for a for ordering process while creating a purchase requisition and encumbering those funds again. We know what's been spent or what, what's been ordered that we have to pay for. Reports can be ran to match charges to the correct account, increasing reconciliation efficiency as well. And then we are also working to, um, this will help the district of our financial transactions, you know, transparency, and then also help our staff to by increasing those e-commerce vendors that are available for staff to choose from speed makes up. Just want to express gratitude for you coming in and seeing these old, old sites. Oh, the microphone. Right. Um, <clears throat> I just, I'm just here to express gratitude for you identifying these speeds and addressing them quickly and efficiently. And I, oh, anyway, thank you, thank you for that. Um, any questions from board? Any comments? Is that Carla or okay, Carla? Yeah, I just want to pile on with Danielle and. Um, say the facts that need to be said out loud, even though it's sort of, maybe it's beating a dead horse, but maybe it's not. We learned about the, um, I'm thinking about the reconciliations for 22, 23 in particular. We learned about that failure of reconciliation back in January and spent what, five months trying to get that to go. And um, I just think it merits saying that Michelle and Anna have been in charge and in the house for what, just over four weeks before they got the reconciliations done, um, got the staffing we needed, got the house in order. So I, I don't think it's possible to overstate what a, just what an accomplishment that is um, practically. And I just uh, wanna say, how, uh, just add to Danielle's gratitude and um, the confidence that inspires in our leadership is really important right now. And I just uh, appreciate that you're getting this done. Skyla, anyone else? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for putting the, the Skyward stuff, like getting that working. And like, it seems so basic. Like that's what most people do at home. You're keeping track of things that, that wasn't being done. It's absolutely blown my mind. So thanks for getting that back up and running, I'm sure. All of the staff is going to appreciate the more streamlined process as well. Uh, this inspires confidence. When I was reading this, I was getting really happy. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. So much. Was a good read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this sets us on a positive trajectory. Yes, thank absolutely. you. Anything from online or visitors? Wait, you don't have to take your address again, either. So regarding in, hey, regarding invoices that you've been processing, have you seen any that have errantly had sales tax charged to them? Or are you all good there? 
I can say you put it there. You can. And then on the audit communications, has someone on the board just been copied on the communications? I believe Carla and yes. our treasurer. And yeah, current on the Yeah. Then this is from the old audit that was done on June 30th, 2022, or for that fiscal year. Yeah. Have the significant deficiencies been addressed, and are there now policies in place to stop those from recurring? I'll have to read that more depth than you have to that. I'll ask you next week. Oh, thank you. Well, and I would say that since then we have approved all of the financial policies through NEOLA. Um, so we know that all of our financial policies are uh, statutorily you know, compliant um, and the most up to date. So, I mean, my business manager who actually looks at them and puts them in her reports, it's pretty so, impressive. <laughs> yeah, but I, she can follow it. Thank you. Actually, he you reminded me of a question that I had to shoot with him. About what is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, just trying to remember my question. Oh, uh, when <clears throat> sorry. Um, when Sama and Schumacher complete their audit, will they be coming back to present it? Willis and talking to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Good. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to item 3D strategic planning and district scorecard. All right. Um, I want to take the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about the fact that our school district had time in the past year to work on the development of its vision, mission, and five year strategic plan. Um, so this presentation is going to highlight the work that's going to set the path forward by looking at some of those key metrics of measurement to demonstrate our continuous improvement in the area of educating um, our young people in this community. So um, dipping into the strategic plan, just providing some context. So some of the key 2023-24 processes that were put into place were the district prepared for strategic planning process in May um, through July of 2023. There were community listening sessions that took place in August through September of 2023. Um, the st strategic planning committees met between September and November of 2023. And then the school board um, did some deliberations, some action, and some advisory recommendations that took place October through December. And as an administrative team, we met to look at the strategic plan and begin to start to consider what aspects of that plan needed to be monitored for progress so that we're demonstrating continuous improvement. Um, the strategic plan execution was starting to begin in January 2024. We had a pending things that were happening in our district. So much of this work um, was put on hold with a good start um, by community stakeholders and in reviewing the strategic plan and looking at that work and my um, former administrative capacity, um, very impressive work in terms of thinking about what was accomplished in that time frame and really powerful work that involved many stakeholders in our school community. So the results of that work were that we came up with a district vision, a district mission, strategic pillars, and district commitments. So the vision of our district is a community that pursues equity where each person belongs and thrives. And our mission is empowering growth, connection, and success for all members of our learning community. Those two pieces strongly reflect what I see in the day-to-day -day work that happens in our buildings. I think it captures what our community um, wants from the school district, and I think the, the team did a really excellent job. And, and from that um, was driven the stra strategic pillars and some five-year objectives. So the five pillars that came forward were whole child growth and success, empowered community, exceptional staff and exceptional leadership, and equitable stewardship. Underneath those pillars were establishing um, what that criteria would look like if these things were manifested. So for whole child growth and success, it was establishing differentiated and culturally responsive teaching and curriculum practices that challenge all students 
close opportunity gaps and support academic and emotional social readiness for high school and beyond. For our empowered community, it would be building connections and partnerships between our schools and the community to ensure equitable access, representation, voice, and understanding. For exceptional staff and exceptional leadership, it would be to create an inclusive work environment that attracts, retains, and celebrates diverse staff, promotes growth in teaching, culturally responsive practices, and fosters a high level of well-being, resilience, and balance in our staff. And in equitable stewardship, it would be improving district facilities with a focus on student, staff, and community needs and environmental sustainability, and developing an annual budget in a sustainable and adaptable for the evolving needs of our district. So our goal is to think about those commitments in terms of taking action. So really looking at articulating some key action steps on an annual basis in this five-year cycle to demonstrate that we are living our commitments and accomplishing these five-year strategic objectives and advancing the mission and vision for student learning and organizational excellence. So the administrative team had an opportunity to, in our January workshop with Joe Schrader, who was our consultant during that time, take a look at what other districts do as a way to measure that. And I provided an example coming from a, a local school district um, that starts to look at what those key performance indicators are and how we could look at demonstrating that in a public way through our website and through district publications about how we are continuing to grow and improve as a district. Um, there are many different models of this. Um, this is just one example to kind of contextualize what I'm about to talk about and what the team has been thinking about as looking at what the Google metrics could possibly be on our scorecard. So pillar one is whole child growth and development. So the team talked about some of the scorecard metrics that would be looking at sort of that, you know, high above the ground view of how we are growing as a district. And we um, looked at proficiency in our math state assessment, uh, proficiency in our reading state assessment, we also felt the need to demonstrate our ability to grow learners. And so our target group outcome score and our state assessment would indicate those students within the lowest 25% and really looking at how we're moving those students and making changes in that opportunity gap that exists. We also believe strongly in the fact that we need to capture how our students feel when they're in our spaces and what that school experience looks like for them. So we were recommending a student at life school survey and have um, talked to some you know, school perceptions about the possibility of coordinating that. And we could look at our own um, district score we would also provide us with comps that are similar to how other students are going about other schools as well. So that's kind of some internal um, you know, regulation we could look at or what we could be looking at in that five year period, seeing a growth and how our students feel about their life at school. And the survey question in there would look at several different measures about whether students felt like they had activities and clubs that they could access, um, they felt they had adults who cared about them. So there's a variety of questions that would build that metric, not just one question. Um, the other key area that we think is going to be very important is early literacy screening and looking at the results of our early literacy screening and doing the most important work of getting our youngest readers um, set on that and looking for growth in that area. So I will um, pause right there and I, you know, I know that you may have some questions about how those markers came to be um, and, and what that might look like on a pretty wall in terms of thinking about that scorecard. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, yeah, I'm thinking I've got to do this. And, okay. I'm pro I'll process a lot because I'm looking at this for the yeah. first time at the end. Um, so it, to me, it looks like it, for a whole child growth, we're kind of putting all of the SEL, like uh, emotional, like EQ, all of that stuff into the survey, like the connection piece, and the rest of it is more academic based. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's interesting. I have... Uh, when I think of the surveys, and I know we'll talk about this more, like when you're surveying the kids at the elementary, like Parkway, you know, that that to me seems harder to sort of like gauge and track. Um, but I, I think that that would be, I think that's that's worthwhile. Um, and when you say the lowest 25% target group outcome score, when you're doing that, are you, is that uh, scores from the prior year? They're the, in the lowest 25, or what is the lowest 25? 
So if you look at if you look at our our total oh no no I just I didn't want to tell you that idea before we get done. I I just wanted to um, so part of what the state assessment and state report plan does is it looks at our metrics and looks at those students who are performing within the lowest twenty fifth percentile, right? Okay. Um, on on our school in terms of their ability to grow as learners, and so we really want to see the accelerated growth. If we're bringing students up and we're we're meeting our mission of educating all children. We should be able to dig in and show growth in that area as a way to improve how we're doing our work, right? So what we're looking for is growth in that area versus just achievement, right? So we want to we want to demonstrate that as a school institution, we are able to move those students and and really um, address those needs and do that well. Um, and that is sort of the marker within our um, report card. And and part of what that does is takes a look at. Um, Two is our close look on the on the deeper end of our work as educational um, professionals is looking at where in those pieces are areas that we need to dig. Like where are those pieces that are not responsive to culturally responsive teaching? Where are those pieces right. that are not meeting the needs of special education students? So, um, you know, in thinking about this work, this is that larger snapshot, but there's a lot of deeper data digging that goes into yeah. that work that would be short cycle work of our teachers, which I definitely would want. The board to also be apprised of, right? Okay. Um, so this is sort of that that way out lens of like, are we moving farther? Okay. Yeah. That okay. That's that was my my other question too. Is sort of what I'm assuming is sort of applied in this is that if you are seeing growth in these areas, you are seeing that because you have a culturally responsive and inclusive curriculum, right? Like that's that's that layered work you're talking. Okay. 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 Um, Carla, I assume you have some questions. Okay. Carla. Yeah, I um you were kind of dropping in and out. So if I'm duplicating something Danielle already said, just uh cut me off. But um I I'm curious what the scope of the student life at school survey is because what I s I'm not sure if that encompasses the sort of um like what I, I think you guys were doing the DAP survey, right? At Glen Hills. And I'm not sure if these metrics encompass continuing to follow sort of the state of mental health of our students. And so so that's what I, that might that was my question mark as I looked at this. Are we going to continue to follow um you know, mental wellness, sort of that holistic perspective on students. Yeah, I believe that we still have a commitment to follow the DAP and to continue to do that and this is certainly not encompassing of all that we measure, right? And so it's really thinking about what are those important metrics that we want to put in front of, you know, front facing to the community to have a look at whether or not we're moving towards that. Um, that certainly adding adding additional pieces into that is is an option also trying to like not overcomplicate a scorecard, right? And so yeah. um did have a lot of really um, thoughtful conversations around the tool. Um, noting too that that DAP survey is not given to any of our students at Parkway. So collecting information from Parkway would be difficult to, to pull out. So we're only capturing part of our school population with that. Um, we also know that surveying is gonna propose um, challenges at Parkway as well. So there might be a, a look at more anecdotal conversations with students as well to pull at that. Yeah. Yeah, I, this is, by the way, I, I should say this is great, seeing this kind of idea of quantifying um, qualitatively, quantitatively, what the work is we're doing is fantastic. Um, I'm just processing it all. And again, I'm sure when I get back in town, I'll be full of questions. Sorry. Oh, don't be sorry. <laughs> well, and then just to add on to, because one thing I would like in looking at the pillar, sorry, um, like thinking about social readiness, also thinking about how we share out like all the amazing sort of steam and uh, GMT and all the like extra, all those things. I know, you, like you said, you can't showcase everything, you know, in a, a dashboard and maybe that falls more under empowered community and like communication, but like, it, I feel like we'd be remiss if we weren't finding a way to sort of highlight all that opportunity our students get and develop their that. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that becomes the, yeah, we we'll get a long list of things. Yeah. And yeah. get at capturing that and really, I think, to being able to demonstrate those questions that would make up the marker. Yeah. And that was part of our thinking, too, around 
having a survey development that doesn't just focus on one question. It isn't just like how do you feel at school, right? You know, it's right. it's a marker that measures several different things, like yeah. you know, yeah. that gets after some of those pieces from a student perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another another question. Sorry, can I go? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, as as you put together these metrics, do you envision that these would be sort of the static metrics you would turn to for five years, or would you be revisiting these year on year? We would want these to be the static metrics, and so that we could look at that growth over time and to make sure that we're looking at that and then in five years, like having that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and also doesn't preclude us from taking a look and saying, you know, there there are other pieces. When I think about the you know, going back to the short cycle goal setting and work that teachers are doing around the assessment of essential standards in the classroom and like having you understand how those short cycles work within that professional work too that they're doing how that DAP survey and also is going to play into that so yeah we would be looking at these as kind of wanting to tr tr try to hone in on what those five-year measures would be pillar two, <laughs> pillar two. so looking at empowered community um we um, recently put out a community engagement survey. Um, and some of these metrics, by the way, would not maybe not be something we measure every single year, right? So some of the advice we got around this was you may want to measure communities since we just put out a survey, we might want to wait a little while because we're not going to see that response in peace. And then the same thing with family engagement survey. So um, some of this would be gathering some baseline information for the school year and then looking at maybe staggering that out and looking at the growth over time. So the community engagement survey and a family engagement survey would be two ways of capturing sort of perception around those things in more of a quantitative way, right? Um, again, looking at multiple questions on that metric to determine a, an overall score, right? Um, if we choose metrics that are similar to other districts' metrics as well, and we go with that, then we also can provide comparables to the look at how we're performing in comparison to other districts' school perceptions. Yes, yes. yes. Right. Um, the identification and communication of partnerships kind of goes to what you're talking about, Danielle, as we felt it was really important to um, be in a space where we look at all of the different ways that we connect with our community and our students are out in the community. And really, um, not just a quantity of them or a quantity around that, because we feel like it's also the depth and the quality of that engagement. So really making sure that we are kind of quantifying that, getting some feedback from those people we have partnerships with and developing a metric around that to be able to say, number one, we have these rich partnerships, we've displayed them, and we're also providing um, attention to them in terms of communicating them out to a broader community. I have a thought. Just a thought. Um, when we do sort of settle on like a survey cycle, which I feel like we've kind of been coming towards, it, it would be good to, oh, I got you. It would be good to um, put that somewhere visible, right? Or as part of our communication chart. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> it's just like, yep, yeah, I, okay. Car is it Carla? Okay. Carla, what do you got? Yeah. Yeah, so um, when I looked at this one, I started thinking about um, what kind of engagement data we might be able to draw from participation in school-based events. And I, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but that's what, just throwing this out there because that's what came to mind. Like it, it would be interesting to track, um, say, uh, caregiver participation in parent-teacher conferences, what percentage of families are showing up, um, you know, how many people are showing up to events and open houses and that kind of thing. If there were a way to track that, to me, that seems like a, a, a nice baseline piece of data that would allow us to track family engagement directly into our schools. Um, so that came to mind. And again, I, I just haven't thought it through enough to think about whether that makes sense or how you would do that. But yeah. um, I know that's been a perennial complaint I've heard over the years, you know, our, our families coming into the schoolhouses. And if we were tracking that data and were able to identify any barriers or deficits, right, it would be a way to um, help us drive decision making around how to improve caregiver participation. I, even, I think you might even that may be more anecdotally available though too, because I feel like administrators and teachers and like, I know which events I go to that are 
well attended uh, to a degree. And but I, I still think you're wherever you are. Your idea is definitely worth thinking about, as well as I think at school events is when we should also be offering these surveys, like whether it's a QR code or it's seeking feedback at that time and trying to like get those responses up because that's we know when and where people are are. Uh, you know, sometimes where we can get them, but yeah. we talked a little bit about um, one of one of the administrators on the team talked about having been in a district and having to flip her count to people who come through the door. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and, and how not necessarily the most accurate way of getting after, like a, you can somewhat do it. Um, and the other part of it is too is really thinking about what we think about in our community too is our. Who are those folks who maybe aren't coming out and how do we engage them, right? And so, you know, thinking about sort of those reasons around that or, or things like that, I think are really important asks or, or considerations for us to make. But I agree on um, capturing people's feeling about how we feel when they leave an event. That's right. It's like, really, yeah, like what is really important. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, like why did you come today? Yeah. What else do you want to come to? Kind of stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So those are great suggestions. and. I think just finding the exact tool and to identify and then communicate those partnerships. Yeah. All right. So pillar three, exceptional staff and exceptional leadership. Um, some of the key areas um, have we dove right back into those metrics that were looked at in terms of where we wanted to see growth was really taking a look at monitoring our staff retention rate. Um, and then also having an opportunity to look at the educational level of our staff and kind of look at what, what um, where their educational level is at in terms of their training um, and towards their craft. Um, also that we have a staff population that reflects our student population. So looking at those metrics to make sure that we have a presentation of our student um, body and getting closer to having that come into balance, um, as well as a staff satisfaction survey as well too, in terms of uh, multiple questions again, to get at how um, staff are feeling about their experience working in our district in terms of their ability to be included and successful in their work. Okay, Carla. I, I'm wondering if sort of you admit you see sort of the work life balance falling uh, being communicated through like the staff satisfaction survey. Okay. Um, yeah, and I would and, and I would say one of the one of the things that we've gone back and forth about on our team is like staff satisfaction or engagement, right? So yeah. feeling like you have purpose and that you can see the results of your work are some of the key markers for any educators who can keep you motivated about what they do. Um, I think that's what drives us. Mm -hmm. It's why we get into this work. So having that sense of number one balance, but then also the ability to really feel like your work is is taking legs underneath you is really what that that falls under. So really engagement satisfaction, those words could be looked at in terms of how we view what success looks like. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't quite know how to say this or word this because I just thought of it. Um but looking at our plan, I wonder if there's a way to kind of measure the percentage of staff that either complete something regarding culturally responsive teaching or um, challenging all students, you know, those are things that we talk about in the first pillar, but would we measure that a little bit in the third pillar? And I, I don't honestly know how to do that. Yeah, I wondered if staff educational level was simply like their degree or is it, or is it professional development? Yeah, and I think with the educational level, we'd be looking at like the the degree, right? And we had a long conversation about this and as a team, right? And and I I think all of us have a we know that it matters. We know that continued education matters in the work that we do. We are an educational institution. We want to promote that, but then there are also components of that, right? And we financially incentivize that as well as a district. Right. Right. Um, I just, I can understand when there's some cautionary pieces there because it's not the be all and end all and we know that. Um, yeah. So I would be open to trying to take a look at, you know, our commitment to culturally responsive or differentiated instruction, universal design for learning. All of those components are really pushing out and planning to the edges, which we know are some of the strategies that as an administrative team we're going to have to dig into to get at moving the needle on student achievement and student growth. So 
thinking about how we honor that as being a part of that bigger picture, I think Chris is a really important facet that we might want to take a look at and think about what does that look like. Yeah, yeah. like I almost feel like um, staff population reflecting student population. Well, my, I have a question about like what sort of what metrics like are you looking at all like ability, gender, ethnicity, race, but like. Is it or is it just a couple factors or what? A, I think we were demographically at this point. We had a conversation about that, right? And so pulling that out and making sure that we are not um, also in a space where we're identifying some of our staff or statistical analysis, right? And so yeah. um, if there's a way that we can capture some of that, it, it, one of the tricky parts was really kind of taking a look at how we could look at our racial identity in many ways, but understanding yeah. that there also are many different intersectional ways in which we identify and our students identify, and those are represented so to me this almost feels like a like a we would give ourselves a pat on the back very quickly and just and keep growing because we already have one of the most diverse um staff like i think in the state or whatever right so like i wonder if it i don't know if it reflects that we have exceptional staff to me that might reflect that we have more different you know we would have diversity um I mean, I, so I guess I'm, I'm, I feel like that one is not like the strongest one for me. Um, and that it could be a goal, but not necessarily something where right, you are putting as much emphasis you, as you are as staff satisfaction, their educational level of potential. To me, it would be more appropriate or to not appropriate, but I would rather know how, how much of our staff has certain kinds of training or certification or culturally response, you know? Yeah. It's, I think you know to go back to the to the pillar. It talks about um, yeah. fostering. Uh, so it, it talks about celebrating a diverse staff mm -hmm. um, that promotes growth and teaching culturally responsive practices um, and attracts and retains. So I think one of the pieces of that was really starting to think about you know that representation matters, right? Training matters, but representation does matter, mm -hmm. and then having our students see themselves in their educators and their leaders is really important. Yeah. Um, and so wanting to make sure that we capture that and and capture the sense of being in an inclusive environment. Yeah. So it's not just about attracting or bringing some some door. It's about creating that culture of acceptance around adults, which yeah. actually think translates to better yeah. practices around kids. Yeah. And so I think. Having that as an aim and, and thinking about that is, I think, where as an administrative team, we spent a lot of time yeah. looking into that and not really sure about how, like you're saying, there's going to be different ways to represent that. And it may not be a perfect measure. Right? Yeah. And I don't believe that it is, but I also believe that the aim of what we're trying to accomplish and making sure that we have representation for our students mm -hmm. and creating a work environment that feels safe and comfortable for all members of our staff is huge in terms of staff engagement and staff yeah. connection. And maybe that's the first step that maybe in five years it's like looking at affinity groups or cultural representation through events or fair or what you know, things like that. I think that's it. Yeah, I know. I know it's tough. Carla? Yeah. Oh, I, I was just sitting here thinking that, you know, with all these sort of, um, when we talk about um, representation, these numbers are going to pop around a lot. And um, I'm sure you're already thinking about this, but we would be looking, we would need to be looking at rolling averages because I think you'll, with turnover, you can expect to see JAGs with us not having a, you know, a huge, um, pool of employees, right? We're not that big a district. So that I'm just thinking about that kind of thing, wondering how you would um, how you would plan to um, manage kind of the the data noise. But I it, it's just something that was in my mind that rolling averages are probably the way to go, but but I don't know. Okay. Just basically be like summarizing it's like I feel like staff population reflects students is like a like a hiring like because otherwise it starts interfering with your staff retention role there it's like it's just really what you're aiming for <laughs> so like, and I the way you have listed retention seems more important and I think that it <laughs> needs to be more important so that's more like a how do well, we have natural, natural attrition? I mean, like, yeah. right, 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 so, right. So, Although we have pretty much young staff, but yeah. 
Yeah, and when we think about staff, too, that extends beyond our teaching staff, but right. that extends to yeah. our professional staff yeah. or another staff that we have in our buildings, our, our leaders, right? So there's there's a wide, I mean, there's a wide swath of, and we do see more turnover in certain periods, right? right. Yeah. Well, and going back to our the equity survey that we did maybe two or three years ago now, I'm not sure, um, The there was a pretty clear narrative from our staff of color about feeling sort of tokenized or marginalized or, you know, like just not like well represented. So I, I appreciate that focus and effort for our current staff who you know, um, don't feel as represented for whatever reason. So I think it will help with attention. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pillar four. Pillar four, equitable stewardship. So some of the scorecard metrics that we could be looking at is the need to seek to um, bring up our fund balance percentage, right? Because um, we know that that is an important part of um, our fiscal health. Um, having state, you know, stakeholder input on a balanced budget and priorities within that area and really engaging our community in a much broader way um, to influence that as well as our internal stakeholders as a part of our community and having Michelle tap into that um, work with them to determine how that budget is put together. And then really looking at um, tenure of capital and maintenance planning as part of that work and, and having that plan in place and looking at what that looks like in terms of the way that's what it seems. How old is our tenure capital maintenance plan? What year are we? At? <laughs> um, so our, our capital maintenance plan was reviewed. And, um, so we had a plan, I believe, that was done in 20, I'm going to try to go back in 2021. Yeah, that sounds right. Right, right. In 2021, yeah. um, with some of the work that was done last year and an exploration of potential capital referendum, we didn't have that updated. So we do have some pretty fairly current information. Okay. And our head of custodians right now are going through that list and reprioritizing it. So we're wow. in the background of what is happening to so kind of have a clear picture about exactly. what those needs are. For me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so what that would would tend to look like if um, you can kind of go to that last part is um, putting together something that would be front facing and Taylor, do you want to put that and it will show up? Oh. We'd be putting together um, a scorecard and um, that would be front facing on our website. Um, where with this during this particular school year, we would be looking in the 24 or 25 school year, looking at pulling together some baseline information and then looking at holding that out and, and finding a way to you know, continue to monitor that to show that growth. And so, um, and, and we know that there will be growth in some areas and there may not be in others, but both of those things tell us about how we can get better. Um, I think having kind of that aim in mind really helps us set the course for what our, our goals and objectives are for our district and really making sure that we're driving towards that mission and that there's intentional work that the community and the board is having eyes on to make sure that that's continuing. When you're looking at like surveys, are you going to... How do other schools do that? Do they pull out like a question, like a main question, or like you're looking at an overall school plan? So with the surveys, typically what um based on what you want to try to capture, right? So you have a survey that catches a swap of things, and there's a lot of data that comes out of it, right? So there's a bunch of data, a bunch of questions that come out of that that we can look at as a board and as a school community and teachers and educators in our buildings to, to help shape our practices and our work. Um, what we would do for this particular piece is look at Maybe there are five questions that talk about like inclusion and belonging. Do I have opportunities that fit my interests? Do I feel like I have people who care about me? Do I have friends at school? Those kind of things. We would pull those in and do like a, a, compi a composite score okay. of those yeah. questions that need the metric we're seeking. I think I remember it's yeah. your perceptions kind of showing yeah. us that on some of there. Yeah, so basically okay. what you would start to take a look at is that you would um, be getting a survey that would give us in-depth information that can kind of help make us better in many ways, but that we would be pulling the sort of like a gloss score out of it that we would look at. And if we choose a score that if it's been a positive trial in a way that other districts have done it the same way, because it kind of was people are kind of similarly mm -hmm. measuring those things. We can also look at that comparison data, not for our scorecard, but in terms. So I think um, what I 
would propose or, or like to do is have an opportunity to have you guys sit with us and think about it and then, um, you know, kind of gather some feedback from you so we can work as an administrative team to refine it. And so, you know, wanting that to, to be in alignment with where we're all moving because it's our fun to work together and it's so making sure we move forward. So I will give you time to think about it and you can all, um, you know, let me know what questions you have or suggestions. And I think. Based on our conversation tonight, I see some people five minutes of discussion with our team too. Yeah. All right, moving on to, I believe, is it Superintendent Report? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, just to report, um, I recently attended the Wisconsin Association of District Administrators 2024-25 First Year Superintendents Academy in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Um, it was a two-day in-person training, but it's part of a larger 20-plus experiences designed to support first-year superintendents, of which I'm one. Um, and this is going to include some in-person workshops and virtual academies, networking opportunities, also some executive coaching. Um, it's designed um, for us to, to have that kind of just-in-time learning as things are cycling through the year to make sure that we get what we need. So it's a very valuable resource um, that I'll be participating in. Um, some of the workshops that were presented was uh, were on um, policy governance, so really thinking about um, governing that emphasizes vision values and servant leadership and uh, accountability and clarity of responsibility. Um, strategies for effective board and superintendent relationships, so looking at, you know, how can you establish meeting calendars in advance and really looking at some of those communication tools for communicating with the board effectively. Um, Effective communications. We did have some communication experts come in from the Donovan group to talk about sort of how do you how do you communicate when times are turbulent and what are those resources that are available to you for our membership of WASDA. Um, also, creating and posting agendas for meetings and making sure that those meet those legal requirements. Um, school and business finance. So we had um, some good friends from Bear there who were presenting <laughs> on school finance. And what I thought was really great that they did with that is they provided us all as uh, superintendents with local information for our own school districts as we learned about it. So we look at our own numbers, which is really helpful. Um, community engagement. So um, ideas around leading an effective community engagement to establish common ground and decision making through a strategic approach. Um, this particular piece of um, the workshop was really um, interesting to me in terms of looking at ways to engage the community um, as a whole, thinking about what matters um, to us and um, being kind of that outreach within the school community to get at multiple stakeholders, our teachers, our staff, our students, our parents, um, our seniors in the community, and how do we start to create spaces where we hear their voice. Um, I think this is going to be particularly important as we work with our community forward. Um, then strategies for building productive relationships, which was led by some veteran and retired superintendents. We had some great tidbits and ideas about how to um, support that. And then um, also um, legalities around taking minutes for school board meetings um, and, and some of the more technical work. So um, I believe that this ongoing learning and coaching is going to be important for me as I move this school year and important for us to work together and help me guide that. So thank you for the opportunity to attend this class. Yeah, how many how many other first year superintendents were there? I believe we were right around 40. 30. A big cohort. It's been a big cohort. And I believe if I remember, there are 48 in the state right now, 48 superintendents in the state of Wisconsin. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's really good. I'm excited for you. That sounds thank you. I like to. <laughs> um, okay, moving on to 4A, uh, employee hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, any questions on Anna's superintendent report? Um, okay. Oh, wait, sorry. I've got one. <laughs> See, I stopped. <laughs> Thank you. Carla, I'm going to get my old job back. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you mention part of the meeting you had attended was making sure you knew what the laws were and I was wondering, is there anything that you're not necessarily in compliance with that will be changed going forward? Or if there were other recommendations that you might be doing stuff legally now, but want to do additional changes? 
Yeah, I would say I, I, I don't believe that we're in any situation where we're not following the open meeting laws, which is great news, right? So got that part right. So I'm happy about that. Um, but what I'm excited or I mean some of the learning about this is as I took over this position, looking at some of our agendas and how they were put together. Um, some of the advice around having more clarity with the agenda so people from the public know exactly what's being discussed. And so those are changes um, that I'm also trying to make, as well as tying um, much of what we talk about here to our policies because those govern um, the work that we do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> agenda item 4A the employee handbook. And then you want to just. Yeah. So our um, the handbook um, was um, presented um, and it's prepared to acquaint staff with sort of the policies that are in place and rules and regulations. It should be noted though <coughs> that the board policies outweigh the handbook if there's ever yes. a conflict, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a guide for our employees to know what's expected of them um, and sort of what their rights are within our school district. Um, what I'm bringing forward tonight for approval is the revised version of the handbook. Um, um, it reflects edits from legal counsel as was advised by the school board um, during the January 11th, 2024 meeting. So again, we're picking up a piece of work that maybe had been stalled for a little bit as we were dealing with other issues that we need to move forward. Um, and that um, accepting those recommendations from legal uh, counsel were the caveat to find approval. Um, I'm recommending that the school board make a motion to approve the handbook, um, knowing that the school board retains the right to, to make changes to that handbook at any time. And so we will look at that as a continued work that we will need to do to have eyes on. Right. Yeah. So uh, I have a motion before discussion. I move to approve the student, the, I'm sorry, the employment handbook. I'll second. Uh, okay, so there is now a motion on the table to approve the employee handbook uh, as revised by the people and uh, discussion. So any questions for Anna? Anything online? Anything from visitors? Okay. Um, and I will just say, I think the lack of discussion is because there aren't really substantive, there have been no substantive changes made to the handbook as it was approved. Back in January, it's simply we had legal go through. They might have changed some grammar, language, etc. So, uh, but nothing substantive was changed. Um, okay, then I'll do a. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, we will do a voice vote. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Uh, there she is. Any opposed? All right, the employee handbook is approved again. <laughs> finally, finally. Okay, uh, this hopefully will be a quick moving on to 5A. So this is board member reports and the goal of this agenda item would just be for the board to keep our momentum around uh, planning for board workshops, uh, which we've discussed. And so it has been proposed by Carla that we utilize the Wednesday in between our board meetings to uh, have a board workshop, which would be a, you know, less formal, where we could focus on certain items that we've already sort of talked about. So um, Karen has said she, she was fine with how, what consensus will be on priorities and that the second Wednesday seemed to work for her. So logistically speaking, does that, did that time frame, that idea work for you guys? Still work for you, Carla? Anna, does that yes. work? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and so that means we were looking to schedule something for, so we would have one in sept uh, September, we say October, November, and then not December. Is that right, Carla? That's what I was thinking, that we okay. should skip December because it's the holidays and everything is winding up. Okay. And then sometime in November or December, we can talk about the need to continue with workshops in the spring. And so, okay, great. And we have a school finance one coming up next week. Next week, okay. Um, and then Carla had proposed that we uh, address superintendent and board evaluations as the next priority. Um, 
and then we were looking right Carla and that would be in September yeah to me I think that's a, a urgent priority right right uh, behind budget but close okay. close by so I would do if it was me I would do evaluations in September with the goal of adopting them right in our last meeting of September of adopting it if we can agree on an evaluation process for Anna and for the board and then in October what was I I was thinking communication norms is something that has come up a lot um and then uh, for November, we could do TBD or we could look at some governance issues, make it sort of a governance workshop. It's possible we'll have to come back to finance. That's kind of what I was thinking loosely. Okay. Chris, I was just wondering about the possibility of elevating the communication, um, you know, because we've heard constituents kind of wanting more information about budget and, and things like that. And um, I just wondered if that had a, like a high, I, I feel nervous about waiting on that for too long. So I, th I think if we're having a workshop around communication norms and communication sort of plans, that that might be different than what you're talking about. Like, I think if you're talking about wanting to put a communication out around budget, that may be something we could, I mean, I think if you're saying early fall, you're already sort of contemplating something going out for early fall. But what I like about communication potentially in October is that um, uh, we will be, well, I don't know, because I'm thinking about the referendum. And if we pass the resolution to ask the referendum question, I think talking about communication and planning there is really important. Too. So, um, I also think emails are important because you've now been working for, you know, or well, effectively our superintendent for some time. And it, and I also think it's important for the board to, you know, um, publicly reflect and evaluate ourselves and sort of model that accountability and growth that we're trying to put in this, like with a strategic plan. So, I, I mean, I don't know about it. I'm by the way, Anna, do you have something about where? Oh, Carla? Do, do, Anna, do you have a, an opinion on this? It's your evaluation we're talking about. So I don't know if you feel strongly about whether you want us to wrap it up and formalize something in September or leave it until October. Um, I think I think Chris's point about communication is going to be really important. And I'm wondering if there isn't a place, you know, thinking about that communication, whether that needs to be, we could look at splitting the time in the workshop and we're spending two hours, essentially, um, I would prefer, you know, we could look at maybe doing a longer workshop in September and that there's a need there and maybe bypass one in October because I do think there's some value in the timeliness of, of both things, um, knowing that um, we will be seeking to have some communication come out. I really think yeah. it's really important to, yeah. to, to touch on that for sure. Yeah, I think job. I have flipped on it too, Carla. <laughs> but what but another wondering though around emails is if if you if we are able to maybe offline get do some of that work yeah. about like what that could look like, then we could bring it as a almost like do like the board evaluation could be we could do our self evaluation in a workshop, right? Like you could we could do that publicly and like we could set the framework outside of a workshop and we can focus on it with more within. Yeah. So so what what if in September we looked at Anna's evaluation but not the boards and then started the work around communications norms and planning? I I think that okay I think that's good. Um and, and then, then I I continue ahead. to work. I feel like we need very specific uh, direction on our, um, uh, at least I feel I need it. Maybe maybe I'm the only one, but I, I am worried about the limit, about violating limits on what I'm allowed to say about referenda. I would like really firm guidance on what I am and I'm not allowed to say um, with respect to any referendum we might put on, on the ballot in November. Yeah, I also think you could almost, you could come in October, you could also split it, continue the communication norms and plans, and then focus on the board eval in October. 
and then um, TBD in November. I, I first think budget might be on there if things change in October, but yeah, I think we can yeah. see. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was looking ahead of the calendar. Yeah. In October, we shifted our 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 basically our meetings are a week later than they normally would be. Okay. So the Gosh. week we them is actually the district fall showcase is scheduled in this room yeah. that day. So that's okay. not going to work. It's a fall showcase. Yeah, there's cool. there is a fall showcase and it will be held here in Glen Hills. It'll be like a like event. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. So that's okay. gonna work out. Anyway. Let's do it all. Uh, okay. 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 Nice. Okay. okay. So we've got the next two workshops planned. Consensus, and we'll firm up the agenda or the what we're gonna be working on more specifically in those workshops. Okay. And then awesome. Anna. Anna, do you want me to try to learn how to use Doodle to? I know how to use Doodle. <laughs> okay, can you help me Doodle that then, or teach me how to Doodle? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if it doesn't, in the Doodle machine, I I'm starting to learn the Google <laughs> machine. And... <laughs> okay. Uh, is that for Carlo? Oh, for Tim. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, please. Um. So August will be school finance. Yes. September will be um, superintendent evaluation and uh, communication norms. October, a continuation of communication norms and board eval. And then we're not doing board governance in November or we are? TBD. TBD for that. Nothing Wonderful. And then um, are these workshops, are these um, are these like open to the public to They're attend? Open, but I don't think Okay, so no um, no recording and no Zooming, but open to the public. Thank yeah. you. Um, they will be open to the public and there will be no action taken. Like Got it. Any of them, um, likely we would have, uh, it would be more for information and supporting uh, clarity for the board. Yeah. Okay, so it will, it, there likely will, so there likely will be um, public notices, but not formal agendas, right? Uh, there will be public notice and agenda. Oh, okay, and agendas. Okay, thank yes. you. Now we can move on and then to a brief closed session, right? Okay, so um, oh, okay. So yes, yeah, please. Um, I move to recess into closed sec session for section nineteen eighty five one C. Consider considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employer, employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility specifically to review personnel changes. Second. Um, okay, there is a motion and a second to move into to recess into closed section pursuant to section 1985-1C. I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Chris Robinson? I'm Katie Avalos. I'm Carla Pennington Cross. We'll probably not be in the closed session. Aye. List. Oh, I okay. Daniel Bailey votes aye. Uh, so we are going to move into closed session. Um, we will not be taking, oh, we. We'll probably will be taking action. Okay. All right. Um, given the given the complications of closed sessions, I think I'm gonna. I you know with with the virtual, I think I'm gonna bug out and let y'all manage that. Hope we don't go off the rails. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Behave. We will make it to the next room. Yep. Take the action. I don't think it'll be. Bye good. everyone. Bye. Thank Carla. you. Bye. Okay. Uh, we are back in open session. Now would be the time for any motions. For uh, I motion to approve the hire of a paraprofessional for Parkway School to fill a an existing position. Okay. Second. Okay. So there is a motion to hire a paraprofessional at Parkway. Um, and as it has been noted, we are not. This is not creating positions. This is to fill an existing. Yeah, an existing position. Um, all in favor, voice vote aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Nope. So we will welcome this new paraprofessional. Um, review of to do items, item 7A. So we are knocking things off of our list. Employee handbook was on our list. That's gone. Strategic plan and district scorecard update happens tonight. And what remains on our board to do for now is the Good Hope Info Packet and the Buildings and Grounds update and planning, which we are looking to do in September. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, awesome. Any item 7B, any future agenda topics? Okay. And board meeting debrief. Um, any thoughts about tonight's meeting from anyone? This was an incredibly efficient meeting, and I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I yes, I would I would echo that, and I would say when I think about our leadership team right now, like I'm I'm so happy I could cry at how just at the confidence and troll that has been that is raised and raised every time we meet. It is a relief as a board member, um, and I am so grateful. Uh, Anyway, yeah, that. So I think, yeah, it's a relief as a recent board member too. Like I sat in a lot <laughs> of really long meetings where we really didn't learn a whole lot as a mm -hmm. community member. So I like this better. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Uh, item eight A. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, voice vote. Hi, thank you.